asked him. He was just sharp as a tack. And then uh, the following year, he, he uh, because I read it in the, you know, was it the, uh, I forget whether it was the 222nd uh, thing or whether it was in the Reveille, Rainbow Reveille, okay. that he, he passed away. He's a great guy. He was just great. He was 102, 103, I don't know, something like that. Well, one of the guys who did was 102, the other one was 99. Oh, it was 102, two he, weeks later. He must, have, he must have snuck in when he was 15 or something. It wasn't that far off. <laughs> 16 years old. 16, yeah, yeah that's it. <laughs> this, um, this isn't a very painful proposition. I, I've done this okay. a few times. I, I suspect you have. Know, Spielberg even sent a crew up from the New York office there very nice. to do me. And uh, I had an earlier appointment. Uh, Alan Chartalk wants to do me for an hour. I don't know whether it was radio or television. I'm not sure. Okay. But I, um, and um, there's three of us that have been going around to schools and churches and synagogues and so mm -hmm. forth talking to the kids. And um, they got us running. That, that is, that's been phenomenal. The kids, we do, we each do about seven, eight minutes, a little bit of background on who we are and what we did in the Army and whatever. And um, we ask for questions. And um, we now book no less than two hours. And we go over time. The kids, the hands never go down. Unbelievable. We did Hudson Falls High School. Uh, and this was early on. We were only booking an hour and a half. We went from an hour to an hour and a half. <laughs> and um, and uh, and uh, we were supposed to talk to uh, from 1 to 2.30. Mm -hmm. And never got out till 4 o'clock. Unbelievable. Goodness. They're hungry. And the phenomenal part of the whole thing, the teachers weren't born yet. Yeah. So, and, and uh, every now and then we go, well, gee, this stuff is not in the books. You know, I said, of course not. What you have in the books came off of the front page of the New York Times back in 1944. Right, right. <laughs> and then it was digested by somebody else. Yeah. Well, uh, we're uh, going to interview Mr. Richard M. Marowitz. Uh, Correct. At Latham headquarters. Uh, it is October 3rd, 2001. Michael Akey, interviewer. Wayne Clark, uh, <coughs> videographer. Where were you born? I was born in Middletown, New York. Okay. Um, on February the 6th, 1926. You grew up in Middletown? I grew up in Middletown. I went to public school, junior high, and then we moved to Brooklyn, the home of the Brooklyn Dodgers. <coughs> and I was walking distance from Ebbets Field, and I went to one game, and the team was great, but the fans were the worst fans I ever saw in my life throwing bottles on the field, and I said, well, the hell with this. I'm taking the subway to the Bronx. I'm going to go to Yankee Stadium, and I became a Yankee fan. <laughs> um, that's a great story. Um, now, where were you when the, the war broke out? When the war broke out, I was on Broadway with my father, and the Times thing mm -hmm. was going around, and uh, there was the, uh, that's the first place I saw it. Really? What uh, and do you remember any impression? I, I couldn't believe it. I didn't know what to, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, and then of course uh, I wasn't 18 yet. You're still in high school at that point. I wasn't 18 yet, and um, then actually I, I I played the trumpet, and um, I was a little ahead of my time with that too. I joined the union when I was 16, doing club dates around New York, and if I was if they knew how old I was, I never would have made it. And uh, went on the road with a band, actually a couple of bands. Mm. And uh, I, um, I uh, turned 18 in Dallas, Texas. I was playing at a club in Dallas, Texas. And I went into a draft board in Dallas and signed for the draft. I knew it was going to happen, mm -hmm. so I had the address of the Brooklyn um, draft board, and I had them transfer it there. And they finally caught up with me. Um, and. Uh, I got a call from my sister to come home for the physical, and I was in so fast. I weighed 124 pounds. I was dead white from working all night and sleeping all day. And um, 
And these big guys were, you know, you know, she was stamping them, rejected, rejected, rejected. And this skinny bag of bones walks up there and accepted. And I said, what are you, blind? <laughs> but it was, um, I uh, don't really regret it. I don't really regret it. Where'd you go for basic? I went to Camp Croft, South Carolina. At that point in time, it had slipped to third place. Mm -hmm. What I mean is, it's a gorgeous little camp in uh, Spartanburg, South Carolina, mm -hmm. and a gorgeous little camp, and um, had the reputation for years of being the toughest infantry camp in the country, believe it or not. And they got a new commander in there that wanted to bring it back up to first place. And the training was so tough, he was burning guys out. The guys were going to the hospital. It was awful. And um, uh, they um, uh, finally got a new commander in. They got this nut out of the <laughs> out of the office, and uh, it was still it was tough. It was tough. My problem was that I was going to a specialist side of camp, so everything. 17 weeks basic. So the first seven weeks, uh, I was supposed to do everything that the other regular, you know, straight rifle guys get in 14 weeks. So they had us go night and day. Mm -hmm. Then the next seven weeks, we're supposed to go to school, learn the code converter and... Now, why were you going... What was this other training for? Uh, bugler. Bugler. See, I couldn't get into a band. So they said, how about being a bugler? I said, great. Well, I didn't know a bugler in the Army at that time was a scout and message center runner. <laughs> so I didn't make out too well with that. And um, so I was getting all this special training. And about a week into school, um, one weekend, uh, they, they said, well, they need, they need the straight riflemen overseas. We don't know what to do with you, so we're going to run the first seven weeks over again. Well, it took three or four days to get the guys who were over the hill back to work, and uh, so we did the first seven weeks over again. Then, you know, two weeks maneuvers mm -hmm. and testing, and then we were out of there. And, um, but I, um, I don't regret it. That training paid off later on. I was, uh, well, you, you traveled some as a young man. Oh, so yeah. So what was South Carolina like uh, coming from Brooklyn? Well, South Carolina, Spartanburg, was, uh, was a village. That was, and it was all bars, mm -hmm. you know. The army took over the town. It was it was it was ridiculous. It was totally ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, and uh, you know, I wasn't used to the black and white. Everything was marked black and white, and uh, and that really teed me off. Um, Did you see examples uh, of discrimination? Oh yeah, oh yeah. I just you couldn't avoid it back in those days. And uh, uh, and I really uh, I got on the bus one day. And I always liked to ride in the back of the bus. And I went right straight to the back of the bus. Bus stopped. And everybody's looking at me. And the bus driver says, get up in front of that white line. You know, white line in the... Uh... I said, why? He says, you can't sit back there. I says, did I give you my dime? He said, yeah. I says, I'll sit where I want. He said, the bus ain't moving. Now I see all of these rednecks looking at me. And I said, well, I, I said, open the door. I got off of the bus. I said, I don't want to deal with these idiots. <laughs> so, uh, basic um, ends and... Basic ends, and I had an 11-day delay en route to go to Camp Gruber, Oklahoma, Oklahoma, to join the Rainbow Division. Okay. And the first thing that happened to me walking down the street after I checked in, they, said, they put me right into headquarters company, mm -hmm. 222, great regiment. And uh, they put me in the headquarters company, and and um, and, uh, and I didn't know what I was there for. I didn't know what I was supposed to do, but I was still listed as bugler. So they, I went every day. I went over to the rec hall because Corporal Stippy was in charge of the drum and bugle call. So they gave me this plastic bugle, and I'm double front, tugging and triple tugging, and you know, doing all this crazy stuff on the bugle, and it blew his mind. It just blew his mind. It blew his mind. So he said, how did you learn how to play a bugle like this? Said, I brought my own mouthpiece. I had my horn with me. I used to go to the rec hall and jam with the guys. <laughs> and um, and uh, then I found out what I was doing there. The, the bugler that headquarters company had was unfit for overseas duty. So I was taking his place. And, um, 
And uh, that's what I was doing there. And, um, uh, and then I helped them pack to go overseas. Good group of guys? The company? It was, a, I didn't really know a heck of a lot. I, I packed, I was busy. I'm kind of a workaholic, kind of a nut anyway. And um, the captain took me up to the, the motor pool because they, and he gave me the clipboard and he said, these are the numbers that go on those crates and you supervise. And he told me what to do. He says, somebody will be here in eight hours to relieve you. And nobody showed up. So I went to this lieutenant and he says, well, I said, somebody's supposed to take my place. He said, well, just keep doing it and I'll find out about it. I never saw him again. So another eight hours went by and the same thing happened. So the following morning, Captain McLaughlin, my company commander, walked in. He says, what are you doing? I says, I never left. He says, you've been here 24 hours? I says, you see all those crates? I could have my name on them. He says, get in my jeep. And he went over and he bawled the hell out of one of these second lieutenants. And, um, and uh, he took me back and, and he, uh, into, the, into his office. He showed the first sergeant. He says, this guy is going to sleep. When he feels like it, when he wakes up and when he feels like it, you just tell the mess sergeant to give him whatever he wants. And after that, forget the quarantine crap. He says, give him a pass and let him go to town for, well, two, three days. Doesn't make any difference. <laughs> so I said, gee, that's pretty good, Captain. He says, you earned it. <laughs> that was it. And Captain McLaughlin probably turned out to be one of the nicest and best officers I've ever had because this followed through. Uh, his wife lived in town. Mm -hmm. And he would go over and say, you going to town? Yeah. Take my car. And take it. You know, he gave me his wife's address, you know, his, where his wife was living. And drop it off at the house. Well, yeah, no problem. Then he'd take us all home, drunk or sober. It didn't make any difference uh, when he found us. And, um, but he was a great guy. What made him a good officer? He didn't have to holler. And he didn't have to scream. Although he could have, he was a big, tall, very handsome Irishman from Los Angeles. And he was, he was the kind of a guy you just had to like. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, uh, and he liked action, action, but he wasn't getting it. Because theoretically, his, one of his jobs was to find the next CP. So if we were in this little village and the, and the, and the, the, the regiment moved up and he would find a suitable CP in the next village or whatever. And, um, but that wasn't good enough. He wanted action. And um, so his, his, um, his driver's name was Flat. This is F-L-A-T-T, I think it was. And, uh, and he said to me one day, do you know anything about a 50 caliber machine gun? I said, I can take it apart and put it together blindfolded, which was a lie. <laughs> he, I'm sure he knew it. And he said, get in the Jeep, because he had a 50 mounted on his Jeep. And he, and he said to Flat, get in. And we went out into the woods, and he was pointing at trees, and I was chopping them down. He says, that's good. So the three of us were always where we weren't supposed to be. And his, his dodge was, I'm looking for another CP. But when you meet the I in our platoon out in no man's land, <laughs> you know that you're too far out, right? And um, to give an example, of what kind of a guy he was. Uh, they used to get a liquor ration every month. And uh, his liquor ration came in, because we didn't know when he was getting one. Like, so he says, you guys come in, here. come in to see Pete. So we went in, and he went into his little room that he had for an office. And the desk or the table, whatever it was at the time, was loaded with booze. He says, OK, you guys, take whatever you want. Well, you know, I, Captain, uh, what would you say? He says, take whatever you want. I says, well, what is this for? He says, I have your necks out where they're not supposed to be. We, we split the whiskey ration every month. Now, I don't know if you know any officers like that, but I never met another one like that. Hmm. Uh, that's the kind of the guy he was. Now, you're packing up to go overseas. Um, yep. When did the unit leave? <clears throat> I remember the exact day when we, well, we uh, left in November of 44. Mm -hmm. We got to Marseille, we landed in Marseille, France, 
in November, the end of November, around Thanksgiving. You went direct to Marseille? Directly to Marseille. Oh. Directly to Marseille, the hellhole of the world. Now, had the... Uh, we had it. The division been doing its training stateside? The division didn't go over. We went to three infantry regiments went over, uh, and it was called Task Force Linden, because General Linden was in charge. It was called Task Force Linden, and this is what screws up the records. Actually, the, the rest of the division didn't come over until February 17th of 1945. So we, were, we didn't have any support. So we were being attached to the 86 or the 101st or, you know. And there's, um, there's a, um, a list. One of my buddies, Al Comer, who was one of, the, one of our trio, mm -hmm. he, ha he got this list from somewhere. I guess it was in this, uh, what's the guy that write? The, the writer that writes all these war, war Ambrose? stories. Ambrose. He, uh, there was a list, I guess, in one of his books, and Al had a copy of the list. I'll send it to you if you want. And it lists every division and, um, and, and uh, uh, how many days they were in combat and how many were killed, how many were wounded, percentage, you know, percentages and all that stuff. And the rainbow is listed as coming over on February the 17th, 1945. Um, and uh, only, you know, a little bit of combat and you know, not much action. And um, it's totally wrong. Uh, I'm now a past president of the veterans at the Battle of the Bulge. Now, the Battle of the Bulge people do not have, <laughs> do not have uh, the 42nd Division as having been in the Battle of the Bulge. Because it wasn't. But Task Force Linden was in the Battle of the Bulge for a short time. Now, why, was just, why were just the infantry regiments? They needed all? bodies. Okay. They needed bodies as fast as they could get them. Okay. And... Um, uh, so they sent over the three infantry regiments to get the bodies over as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. And um, then everybody else kind of dragged up, <laughs> dragged in <laughs> later, when, when all the fun was over. <laughs> so you you a core asset at that point? Did the core move you around to wherever? We never knew what we were in <laughs> because they kept bouncing us from the 3rd Army to the 7th Army, from the 7th Army to the 3rd Army. and. Did, do you ever hear of the other Battle of the Bulge, Operation Northwind, which came on the heels of the other, the, the first Battle of the Bulge, um, and this was another thing that you don't hear about much. You're just in the last couple of years, you start to hear about it. They're starting to write about it, and it was kind of a, a hush hush, not popular thing, mainly because um, um, some officers way up there made some mistakes and we lost more people than we should have. And um, um, somebody, I don't even mention his name, said, you know, don't, you know, forget about it, never happened. Anyway. Um, Can we, do you have initials? Well, one was I. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> they made both of them were I. Anyway. Um, I read that somewhere. I forgot where I could tell you where to go for it. I mean, if it comes to me, I'll let you know. Anyway, um, uh, this was considered as bad as the first Battle of the Bulge. The 101st by that time had come down. We were more or less on the bottom of the bulge. Everybody thinks of that stone. They don't realize that the bulge, the front, had a, was over 80 miles, mm -hmm. the, the bulge front. And we were on the southern tip of it, which was also close to Alsace-Lorraine. Right. And, um, and during this Operation North Wind, that Hitler's baby, uh, even the 101st took a bath. And we were attached to the 101st at that time. Um, now, was that your first? Well, let, let's, let's back up. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. You'll get me going because I'll go forever. That, that, that's fine. Uh, we've got a lot of tape, and I can bring in food. Um, you land in Marseille. Yes. All right. So what happened? What happened? What happened? Well, the first thing we did is we got, we got they took us up to CP2. Did you ever hear of that? No. It was a big, huge 
windswept, ice cold sea of mud in the middle of the night. And um, you found the buddy. If he was alive, he got a half a tent. <laughs> and we pitched tents. And, um, um, and we went to sleep. In the morning, we got up, and naturally, the tents were everywhere. Mm -hmm. right? So um, the officers were as green as we were. And um, they were still going by the book. Mm -hmm. the, you know, the book was never written for wartime. It was written for peacetime. Right. And um, so the first thing they did was, you know, get these, get these tents in line, you know. They wanted them perfect. They were, you know, holding the snap string, you know. <laughs> and after that happened, that night, Big Chet Charlie came over. And, I mean, what a target that is, right? He has to strafe up one side and come back down the other. It's just marvelous for them. And, um, so you had a bed check Charlie also? We had a bed check Charlie. What they did was, and everybody had explained, were you over there? No. Never, did anybody ever explain bed check Charlie to you? The 27th Division on Saipan had a bed check Charlie. Well, I don't know what the, but the Germans, what they did is they usually sent over, not a big plane, right. like a two engine job. And they had the, in, the motors a little bit out of sync. So when they came over, you knew it was bed check right away because you heard mm, 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 didn't sound like, mm, 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 because they were out of sync. Mm -hmm. And you knew he was here. So that's to throw a fear of God into you right away. Mm -hmm. And they would drop a 25-pound bomb or something just to keep you from sleeping, you know, just to get you edgy. Mm -hmm. um, they never really did much damage that, that, uh, that I saw. At once I was in a house and it took a piece of the roof off. Later on, scared the hell out of you, but it hurt the house. It didn't hurt anybody in it. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so that that was bed check Charlie. And uh, of course, after bed check came over, they put the tents back where they were in the first place. <laughs> oh, those guys were terrific. There was a learning curve here. <laughs> so how long were you? Uh, we were at bed. We were at uh, CP2 front row. Well, a couple of weeks. And uh, I think I left this on. I don't want it to ring while I should have. Um, and, the, um, um, and then they moved us up to a quiet front. And to, uh, to learn how to, you know, you, you go to college to learn how to become a doctor, mm -hmm. but you don't really know how to become a doctor until you go into a hospital and learn how to become a doctor. Well, the, the same thing happens in the Army. You, you, you've heard that before. So we went in for our baptism of fire tool. It was supposed to be a quiet front, and they spread us out so thin that it was... Now, where was this? This was in the... Um, it was in France. It was still in France. I had a terrible name, so... Uh, <laughs> we were still in France. And... Um, uh, and for a, for a short time, it was okay until um, until the Germans got frisky, and, uh, and the Battle of the Bulge started on December 16th, and um, then they started to get frisky down at our end too, and um, uh, and then we started to lose people, and uh, that the guys learned learned what war is about. What uh, what was your job at that point? My job at that point. Um, was um, taking care of the officers. I was in charge of the mess for the officers and the staff. Uh, how I got that job, I don't remember. But Captain McLaughlin gave it to me. And uh, Colonel Luongo, um, we later got along very well, but in the beginning, he had an asbestos mouth. The coffee could be boiling, and he'd say, coffee's hot. And, um, uh, and I would feed the officers, and they were, they were aggravated. They were prima donnas, and it was a big ego trip. And it was, uh, at that time, I don't know anything about officers now. Uh, I know some officers now; they're great guys. And um, um, and um, so I figured, you know, I went to the, to the to the mess sergeant, and I picked up the food in cans, and I brought it to the room where the officers are going to eat. And they had their own plates and stuff like that. It was a, an army set, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, and I would give them what the GIs were eating. 
But then I started to get even morally. I figured, I'll, I can get even, you know. <laughs> so I would say to Sergeant Sadowski, what are the guys eating today? Well, they can only have one piece of bread because we're short on bread, or they can only have this, they can only have that. This is what they're going to get. I said, fine, and I would bring enough so each of the officers would get the same thing. And then the first time, the colonel said to me, got any more bread? I said, no, the men are only having one piece of a piece today. And, and you know what the book says? The officers eat what the men eat. Actually, small officers are supposed to eat after the men eat. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't go that far. <laughs> but um, this is what I started to do. I started to become unpopular, but not unpopular enough. And one day I said to the captain, Captain, you have to get me out of there. I can't stand these guys anymore. <laughs> so he says, you come with me. And that's when I got to be with Flat and the captain. And that's when we became the Three Musketeers. Mm -hmm. And so your job then, theoretically, was to... Bugler be, again. Bugler again was yeah. to find... But I was kind of hanging out with the captain. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, the bulge begins... Now, are you part of the Third Army at this point? We never knew from day to day what we okay. were in. And it got to a point where we didn't even ask. This didn't make any difference. Wherever we went, they were shooting at us anyway. <laughs> Common denominator there. Yeah, I think we probably were at that time. And, uh, oh, well, about that time also, well, Patton was taking up into Bastogne. So we may have, back, may have gone back into the 7th. But I, then I don't know that either. It's, it's pretty hard for me to say. And the regiment at that point was just maintaining a line? We were maintaining a line. And uh, of course we kept moving, the line kept changing. Mm -hmm. um, and um, naturally, sometimes it went back and sometimes it didn't. And um, we were taking the bath though. We were, a lot of guys were getting hit because we just didn't, we were, the problem there was that they started bringing th everything up into the main body, up towards Bastogne. Mm -hmm. And um, they were taking people from down below. Um, and so uh, we were spread out pretty thin and we couldn't fill in because they were still taking people away from us. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so it got to be a little bit hairy because we're always understaffed and un un we didn't have the support we should have had. Um, so it was. It got a little sticky. Now you're facing what? Uh, mainly Wehrmacht units. Yeah. yeah. What was your biggest concern? Tiger tanks. <laughs> Real tigers or Real ti every tiger? Every tiger. tank is a tiger. Oh no! I'm talking about. You ever see a German tiger tank? Um, well, at one point, a little later on, the, the INR platoon ran into an ambush. We're still trying to figure out who gave the order that caused this. Um, because you don't send an INR platoon out. Intelligence and reconnaissance. Right. Um, you don't send an INR platoon out on a night reconnaissance. Um, that's like, you know, committing, committing a murder. Uh, and um, they sent the INR platoon out on a night reconnaissance. And um, half a platoon got knocked off. Traveling down the road in jeeps, the road is a ribbon at night. You can't see a foot off the sides of the road, but everybody off the sides of the road can see you like daylight, especially when the moon is out. And there was a lot of reflection because there was a lot of snow. So you know, you're a sore thumb going down the middle of the road. So you got to get killed. And you can't see anything. So how can you have a night reconnaissance when you can't see anything? And um, so that's, that's the name of that game. Well, I, the next day, I, um, uh, I uh, volunteered for the INR platoon. And the captain said to me, do you know that's a dangerous operation? You know, you can get killed in that operation. I said, I'm playing the odds, captain. He said, what do you mean by that? I says, well, right now as it stands, it's three to one. 
With them, it's 28 to 1. I'm going with them. If it's okay with you. He said, okay. He said, pack your bag, take, go over to join him right now. He said, but if you change your mind, I'll take you back. So I said, okay. He was a hell of a guy. He really was one hell of a guy. Now the... Um... And we got in a lot of trouble. <laughs> What is the primary mission of an INR platoon? Um, find the enemy and report back. Take prisoners, interrogate. Um, but they generally don't engage. You have no choice. Generally, when you find them, they find you. Sometimes they find you before you find them, because your neck is out. Right. And um, so. There's hardly ever a day when you're not engaged, sometimes more than once. But uh, now, when you do find the enemy, at that point, do you engage them, theoretically, or you just report and... If we're that close, sometimes we just we engage them, because you, you really almost cannot get away from it without it. Uh, most of the time, they see you first. But, you know, you... You come around the bend in the road. We came around the bend in the road. There was a bank over here. We came around the bend in the road. Boom, we almost ran into a bunch of Germans with a horse and a wagon. You know, there were like 40 or 50 of them. And there was, well, we saw split up into squads, two squads, 12 men in each squad. So we, we almost ran into them. And, um, of course, they got more scared than we did. They <laughs> and um, so we just started popping that, that day, I'll never forget that day, I would, so I would be a wise guy. I came across a carbine, and I said, gee, that's why well, I carry the heavy M1 when I could carry this little carbine. You know. And uh, uh, we had the little skirmish, and it was close, and um, this German was in the ditch, and I came down on him, and he was coming up with his, and I went click. And my buddy in back of me, took care of him, and I threw that carbine so far. <laughs> you could tell me that was a good weapon, but it didn't work for me, so I just got rid of it. <laughs> now, um, the INR platoon, they generally move via jeeps or on foot? Jeeps. 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 Always on jeeps. It was, it was seven jeeps. Um, uh, four men in a jeep, 28 men. And... Um, we were assigned our own medic because but it was an aid station back at headquarters company anyway, mm -hmm. so they gave us a medic. So we had two squads, and we split most of the time. We took parallel roads, and the and the and the, um, um, the, um, the medic, the lieutenant, the driver, and the first sergeant. I mean, not the first sergeant, but the platoon sergeant were in the seventh jeep, and uh, he had the the uh, the big 694 radio, so he could call the artillery, mm -hmm. you know, if a cub came over or something. Have a little conversation if we needed help. And um, TO for, um, for an r, &R platoon was uh, two 300 radios, one for, the, one for the platoon leader and one for the rest of the platoon. We ended up with one on every jeep. Hmm. We stole everything we saw. Um, so you modified the TO out of necessity. Well, what good is you got you got two squads, one radio between the two of them. That's not possible, even right? How <laughs> you keep in touch with anybody? It, it is just in, the book is you know some dingbat with a glass eye wrote the book. Um, How else did you improvise? Well, we had uh, there was a, a fifty caliber on the. Uh, machine gun on the uh, lieutenant's jeep, and we were we were supposed to have one 30 caliber machine gun. We had a 30 caliber machine gun on every jeep. We had a couple of bazookas that we, that we uh, acquired. We had uh, grenades. Uh, we had a s couple of 60 millimeter mortars, and we had grease guns, and uh, more BA BARs than we were supposed to have. <laughs> and this was when we we um, were fired on, on the way to Dachau, we were fired on coming out of the woods. There was a little little uh, knoll 
to the side. And took, there was a little village right in front of us. And, um, and we, uh, this almost sounds comical. I mean, and, and we laugh about it all the time. And we, we dragged all our crap up on the hill. And uh, these, those Germans in that village probably thought they hit the point of a division. Because we unloaded on them. We hit them with bazookas and mortars and everything they could think of. Made a lot of noise. We were great bluffers. <laughs> and and, um, and um, then Lieutenant Short, he was, a, he was great. Three men assault the town. Is that an order or what? <laughs> so the, the two point scouts, that's myself and Larry Hancock, and uh, Howard Hughes, who's a great BAR man, went in. And we cleared the first few houses, and then we waved the rest of the guys in. And we got close to 200 prisoners. And we broke up their weapons, told them to put their hands on their heads, and walk back up the road. Now the reason was that we were in a big rush to get to Dachau. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were pushing us like crazy. And, um, and we could, what are you going to do with these guys? Right? So that's what we did. And, and uh, then we took off. Uh, but, but we needed that stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, a bluff works. It really does. You know, we were great poker players. <laughs> <laughs> so the, your lieutenant was a pretty good guy? He was a great guy. His, his father was a general short. Um, this guy um, was a bag of bones, nervous as a cat, um, came up from private, right up into lieutenant, all in the field. Um, I guess he was in Africa. He was in Italy. I know he was in Italy. I don't know about Africa. But he came up. He had. He was. Um, he was nerve wracking. Mm -hmm. I mean, he would get up. I thought. He, I said to him one day, "What do you think you are, George Washington crossing the Delaware?" He stand up. Things are going on. He's standing. Up. You guys go over there. Watch that over there. I said, "Get down." <laughs> he was. He was a pip. He was an absolute pip. But he was. And he watched us. He watched out for us. His captain came out with us one day. He wanted to see. He, he was new. He was put in charge of S2. It was, he messed up Cannon Company, so they put him in charge of his intelligence. And um, really, it's the truth. And, uh, yeah. and he came out with us one day to see how we operated. We got into a little skirmish. And he had this Italian Mauser, I guess it was. And um, this blunderbuss. And he flopped down next to me right over here, and he let go with that thing. And I thought my head was coming off. And when we got finished, I stood up, and I, got, I went right into his face, and I started, I called him everything you could think of. I was really mad. My whole head was ringing. You know? And, I, and I, I had a problem from that time on. And um, um, he, your Benny is court-martialed. When we get back, you're dead. Lieutenant Short walked over to him and he said, you got, you're not going to do a thing. I'm cleaning this up a little for me. <laughs> we appreciate that. <laughs> you're not going to do a thing. I saw what you did. And he says, you had better not come out with us again. Not if you want to go home. And that was the end of that. <laughs> that officer never looked at me again. <laughs> Two minutes. Excuse me. Let, we've got to change tapes. Correct. The morale of the platoon must have been fairly high, uh, a specialized group. Um, this is probably the best bunch of guys I ever worked with in my life. Um, every, I mean, Larry and I, I mean, we work point together a lot, most of the time. Really? Yeah. Matter of fact, they took us out of point one day, and uh, we got nervous because the guys up, you know, the guys up front hadn't worked much, and so every time they saw a bush, you know, they stopped. Or, you know, and we weren't getting anywhere, and you know, and um, so the lieutenant finally came back and said, "Would you guys mind going back up to point?" We said, "No, we'd be happy to do that." <laughs> we trusted ourselves; we didn't trust anybody else. Mm -hmm. 
So we worked point most of the time. And um, it wasn't that bad. What skills did you develop working the point? Well, Larry and, I, Larry and I almost didn't ever talk when we were out. I mean, we'd play opposite sides of the road. We'd never walk the shoulders. That's where the mines are. And, um, and, um, and uh, we'd look at each other and, you know, throw a signal. And mm -hmm. I knew what he was going to do and he knew what I was going to do. We worked together so much. Mm -hmm. And um, we go in like, you're running across a lot of little villages. You don't do this in a big city, <laughs> but um, you, you're running through one village after another, little farm villages and so forth. And um, so we go in, we clear the first few houses and, and then wave the rest of the guys in. Mm -hmm. It isn't like we had a lot of men to work with. Um, uh, we did a lot of things that, um, we threw the book away. How so? Yeah. For example, the INR platoon, uh, I think in the book it says, when you're coming down the road and you stop for any reason, this jeep backs on like this, this jeep goes like this, the next jeep goes like that, right? Theoretically, that's good. You can go in any direction if something happens, right? That's good if, if you're still alive because all the mines are on the shoulders of the road. So you back up onto the mines and you blow up. We never hit a mine. We never hit a mine. Um, it was, it was you, you look at any film of troops moving down the road, they're walking on the shoulders of the road so that the tanks and the jeeps and the armored cars can go through. They're the ones that are stepping on the mines and blowing up. Um, so we ignored, we ignored the, the book. We just, you know, we do what was expedient, you know. Um, um, uh, the mines were a big concern? Well, we, we, uh, we just really never thought about it. We knew what we were going to do, we knew what we had to do, and we just never thought about it. Mm -hmm. We just stayed away from shoulders of the road, period. So there was nothing to worry about as far as we were concerned. As far as the middle of the road is concerned, most of the time, if, if, if there's somebody is putting something in the road, you can see where the road had been disturbed. Mm -hmm. Well, you go around those things. And these become second nature. Mm -hmm. So, so we, uh, we never had a problem. We never worried about those things. How do you generally rate the German infantrymen that you were facing? Well, generally, later on, I can't say this, but generally um, they were better trained better clothed, better armed. Uh, the officers were much better. Um, I would say that it, it's a wonder we won the war. Yeah, honestly. I mean, our tanks, the M4 tank was a gorgeous tank, right? Yeah. What, do you know what they called it in World War II? Bronson. Correct. Or Tommy Cooper, depending yeah. on who's driving. Yeah, well, our favorite expression was the Bronson lighter. But, um, and of course, nowadays you say, what the, they'll say, what does that mean? Because the kids don't know what a Ronson lighter is. Yeah. Back in those days, everybody had Ronson lighters. Um, but, um, but we would, if we, we came upon tank, tank tracks, uh, tracks, and if we saw tracks like this in the snow, well, we just turned around and went the other way. And what are you going to do with the Tiger tank? Mm -hmm. The armament is that thick. Everything we had would bounce off, so there's no point in it. Mm -hmm. um, did you ever go to Patton's Armor Museum? Well, if you happen to be in the Fort Knox area, which is outside of St. Louis, mm -hmm. um, right next to Fort Knox is, is Patton's Armor Museum, and it's the most marvelous thing you ever saw in your life. And we were going clockwise around this thing, and we made this one turn, and there were a bunch of us together. This was. It was a rainbow reunion, mm -hmm. so we were all together. And um, and here's this tiger tank. You know, it scared us. It scared it looking at it. It just scared me again. And uh, they had cut away one side and put plexiglass over it. And they had the bodies of three, you know, dummies, naturally. Three full-size dummies sitting around a table playing cards in the tank. 
and um, you saw the, the steel on this thing, and you, you know, it's still a scary thing. Of course, now we have bigger than that, uh, but but that was just a, a scary piece of work. How do you uh, rate the machine gun? Phenomenal, phenomenal. That burp gun. It's just nothing could shoot faster than that. That's why you ever hear it. You ever hear a burp gun? Just unbelievable. And, and that's another thing. It seemed like almost every German had a machine gun. Um, they were. Uh, it, it's just that uh, later on, as our stuff started to come over, we had so much stuff. Even though they were destroying it, mm -hmm. we replaced it so fast where they couldn't replace theirs. Yep, the the um, the Tiger tank actually. The Tiger tank they had a problem moving their turret. Did you know that? Uh, but it really didn't make any difference if it was a little slower, because um, things were bouncing off of it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll tell you, we were the first ones in Dachau. We were pinned down in the ditch. And Dachau was the only camp that had to be fought for. I don't know if you know that. The other, Buchenwald and all these other camps were walkovers. The Germans just left. Um, the Germans didn't want to just leave Dachau. Uh, maybe because it was the oldest in camp in Germany. It was in Germany. Mm -hmm. um, but they were, they were giving us a pretty hard time. They even dropped some 88s on us. And we were pinned in, that, in the ditch. And of course, we got there a long time before anybody else did. So we were waiting for the troops to come up to us. Now, and, the Dachau was your objective? Yeah, of course, they never told us anything. They got us up in the morning and they said, here's your new map. There's Dachau. Go. You have to make contact with the tail end of the 20th Armored and be liaison between the 20th Armored and the infantry who were coming down in two and a half ton trucks were having a race with the 3rd Division on the left and the 45th Division on the right, and we'd have to win. And every five minutes they called us on the radio and said, well, where are you, what are your grid coordinates, and what's taking you so long? So we finally stopped, and the lieutenant said, this is the way it is, guys. If we're going to be tactful about this thing, we're going to lose the race, and they're going to kill us. Our own army, or the officers are going to kill He says, or we can just step on the gas and go like hell. So we said, well, let's step on the gas and go like hell. And so uh, we, and so the rest of it was like a bad movie. It really was. I mean, um, we went through one village and a German fired a Panzer Faust over our head and blew us right out of the Jeep. <laughs> we got, we, we did him, we got back in the Jeep, took off. That little town where we got the 200 prisoners, that's why we told them to walk back. We didn't have time for those guys. We had to get on the road. Um, we cut one convoy, German convoy, right in half. It was on a crossroad. We went through it, firing as we went, and they just went off the road. They didn't know what the, we weren't supposed to be there. Um, so what happened, they were fighting to get up to us because we raised so much sand on the way to Dachau mm -hmm. that, um, that, um, uh, they had trouble getting to us, um, and um, and all of a sudden we pinned in this ditch, and an M4 tank comes out of Dachau. Did you know what at that point Dachau was? No. You know, you smell a lot of you know different areas. You smell different things depending on what's going on. Now it's not uncommon, or it was not uncommon, to smell death. And usually uh, it was farm animals that were killed or had been strafed or bombed or whatever, and they're bloated and they're rotting in the fields and it stinks terrible. It just smells like hell. And as we got close to Dachau, we didn't discuss it. We were used to that. We all thought the same thing. We never talked about it, but later on, after, it was all, after the fact, we realized that we all thought the same thing. We figured we're coming to another bombed out farm with a bunch of dead animals. That's what we thought. Had no, nobody ever told us it was a concentration camp. See, there is a village of Dachau. So on the map, we saw a village of Dachau. We were going to take the village. That's all we knew.
We did nothing about a concentration camp. So, um, and you know, on a siding, before you even get into the camp, there were 40 boxcars of bodies. Um, Is that what you came on first? Yeah. Because we, we went in the main gate. 45th came in the, the back gate. Um, they still think that they took that. It has been proven and it's been certified that the rainbow took, I don't know if you know it, the rainbow did take that. I can vouch for that. They, I saw a film on um, History Channel, one of those channels, Discovery, and it was all 45th Division and how they went into Dachau from the back and the railroad siding and all the other jeers. And they all remarked, the officers, it was so quiet when we entered. Well, sure, it was quiet when they went in, because we got finished fighting with them <laughs> before they got there. Um, but anyway, this M4 tank came out of Dachau, and we jumped up out of the ditch. And the gun came down on us. It was a captured tank. Fortunately, one of our tank destroyers came up behind us and blew it away. Just in the nick of time. That day was the first time I kissed the tank destroyer. <laughs> uh, but but uh, that was that was a scary moment. Um, so we, the rainbow took that out. You can take my word for it. So you uh, you're in the ditch. The tank comes out. The tank is eliminated. Then where are you going? So, lieutenant uh, colonel, not the colonel, lieutenant colonel. Um, what the heck is his name? He was the uh, he was the commander of Second Battalion. Great guy, tough as nails. He died just about three years ago. He was sitting on the top of that tank destroyer. He, he took a ride in on the tank destroyer, <laughs> and he and we're next to this farmhouse. Mm -hmm. And he said, "Did you clear the house?" We said, "No, sir." He said, "Clear the house." Well, the snipers were all over the place. Mm -hmm. It was. So our job initially was to clear out the spot snipers and all the other stuff. So in the process, we took 25 prisoners out of the basement of that house who were more scared than we were. And, um, um, and the, um, uh, we, took, we took a couple of SS, three SS prisoners. We knocked off a number of snipers. One of them was really driving us crazy. It was in a another house just up, up the street a little bit, and he was really giving us a hard time. So we finally um, did away with him, and then we got up into the house. He was 12 years old. Couldn't have been more than 12 years old. 11, 12 years old. A squirt. Um, Hitler Youth. Uh, so that's, that's a quick Dachau story for you. What, uh, were you Jewish? Yeah. What were the thoughts going through your mind when you reached Dachau? Well, well, as soon as I saw what it was, then uh, probably it's it's you know you really can't describe it. You really can't. It's not it's not possible. It's not possible to describe it at all. Um, it's um, but I'll never forget the 29th of April, 1945. I can I can tell you that. Why is that? Because that's when we took that out. I'll also not forget the 30th of April, 1945, the next day. Of course, 12 of us went into Munich before we took the town. But a couple of our spies, or whatever the hell they were, I really don't know what they were, but they knew where Hitler's house was. And um, we went to Hitler's house, hoping, we knew he wouldn't be there, but we were hoping that, uh, and the town was, ready to give up. Actually, in the afternoon, we just rolled in. There was no problem with it. And these guys said, don't worry about it. The town is not taken yet, but there's only SS snipers in there. So, so, um, so we, were, we didn't have any, we really didn't have much trouble. And um, we got to Hitler's house and banged on the door. And the, um, he had an English housekeeper who called us ruffians. And my buddy Herman, Herb Herman, said, I'm throwing her down the stairs. He had a couple of other little words in there besides. 
And I said, forget it. Let's check out this joint and get the hell out of here. <laughs> I, you know, you're not comfortable when you're the only one in town. Right. And um, so we... Uh, So we went through the place. I ran into a bedroom. I didn't know um, whose bedroom it was, but it was gorgeous. Well, the whole place was nice, you know. And the, and the, the, the furniture was all intact, and the pictures were on the wall, and the stuff was on the desks, and everything was there. And I went in, and I opened up all the drawers, and they were empty. And the closet was empty. And I saw something... Um, dark in an upper shelf and I dragged over a chair and uh, reached up and got it and it was the most gorgeous top hat I ever saw. And I looked inside and I saw A-H in gold and I could put two and two together and it also stands for something else. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I could picture his head in the hat and I threw it on the floor, jumped off the chair and stomped it. And it is, it wasn't a folding hat. It wasn't a collapsible hat. It is now. <laughs> but it was that high, now it's that high. As a matter of fact, I have it in the case. I thought you might be interested in seeing it. Um, and uh, and then uh, Herb tells me I walked out of his bedroom with the hat on and the comb under my nose and then walking around like, uh, like Hitler. <laughs> but it was a and the, the hat that's been uh, now has a life of its own. Mm -hmm. I have a life of its own. Uh, when did the, now you were in Munich for how long? Just that's it. Beside the that day, and then we were out of here. You see, INR is kind of a peculiar situation. Um, the war wasn't quite over. It was almost over, right. but it wasn't quite over, and. Um, you know, you get into a place and you take it, and right away you got new orders. Mm -hmm. Go check out the road too, and you're off again. Uh, so you're, 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 they never even saved billets for us. We would get back. They never knew if we were. We never, first of all, they never knew if we were getting back. But um, and, uh, and we had a 75 percent turnover in our really? term, yeah, and. Um, uh, so we would get back and report in, and they pick our brains, and we ask a lot of questions, and um, and then we would um, and then we go out and liberate a liberate a house somewhere, kick some family out, and we have to take over the house and go to sleep. And we always left a man on guard with the with the radio. Now, with such a high turnover of personnel, how did you treat replacements? New guys coming in. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You know, you, you they, they're going to depend on us. They have to depend on us more than we're going to depend on them. We want to be able to depend on them because we don't have a hell of a lot of guys. So uh, you bring them in and you do what you can with them right away. First, I'll never forget the day I went back to uh, headquarters to pick up a replacement. And I look at this guy. I have his name, Fritz Krenkler. And um, I look at this guy, and this guy's German. And he still had a German accent. And I'm bringing, and so I walk, and I said to him, did you get tangled into the wrong outfit? <laughs> <laughs> he said, no. So I dumped him in a Jeep, and I'm taking him back to the platoon. And um, he says, Rich, I don't know what to do. I said, what's your problem? He says, well, I'm from here. See, his father got the family out just before... Hitler slammed the door. He was able to get them out. Of course, he was German, you know, so it wasn't. Um, and he somehow got the family out just before he, it was not possible to get out anymore. And they got to the States. Fritz went to school for a few years, got drafted, came back over. <laughs> so uh, he says, I have relatives here, Rich. I have relatives. I have friends. I have family here. I can't shoot at these people. So I, he says, how am I supposed to do that? I said, don't even think about it. He said, why not? I said, because these things come naturally. Of course, the next day, it came naturally. Because we ran into a situation and we were, 
were <clears throat> the Germans were hollering us to give up. One of the guys, little Jackie Walker, was stuck in a deep in a ditch by one of the jeeps, and and he couldn't move. They had him zeroed in, and we got into a little clump of woods, and um, and Fritz followed me because I. I, I I'm the one that picked him up. He knew me the best, right? So he followed me up into the woods, and he said, Hey, uh, I dropped my gun. I don't have a weapon. So I had a 45 that I was dying to give to somebody anyway, because that is the worst thing that was ever invented. <laughs> and I said, Here, take this. Keep it. So he was taking the cigarettes out. He says, Don't smoke. He said, What's the matter? I said, ah, the smell of smoke carries, there's a little breeze, you can see the smoke. I said, eh, no, just sit with your back against that tree, and I'll sit with the back against this tree, and you'll follow, you'll check me out, and I'll check you out. Because, he says, why, we're, you know, he, I said, you hear them hollering up there, but that doesn't mean there aren't some people coming down around in the woods here. Said, just keep your eyes open and listen. So he said, okay. He says, well, why are we here? We can get to the couple of Jeeps that haven't come out of the woods yet. We can get out of here. I says, no, we can't. He said, what do you mean we can't? I said, we never leave anybody. I said, Jackie's stuck in the ditch. He said, but, but we can get out. I said, let me say it another way. If you were stuck in the ditch, would you want us to leave you? He says, oh, forget I said anything. He says, so... What are we going to do? I said, well, the getaway jeep, took, the last jeep in line was called, we always called the getaway jeep. Something happens, jeep takes off to get some help. So about a half hour later, they came back with some rainbow rangers. And then together, we cleaned up the mess, and that was all over with. And you got Jackie. And we got Jackie. Nobody got hurt, and everything was fine. But, uh, but Fritz, we went through another village that same day, and he was looking to kill Germans. He was, he was, he, he had, he was a totally different man. So you didn't, I said, Fritz, you see how quick you learn? Nothing to it. And he was a good guy. He really was a, I guess awesome. when somebody starts shooting at you, that gives you an attitude to Yeah, yeah, it gives you a little incentive. You know? <laughs> I see these guys every year, and they're the best there is. Yeah. Now, um, after, after Dachau uh, and Munich, was that? That's pretty much the end of the war. I mean, we were talking about April 30th was Munich. The war was over, what, May 6th or something? Mm -hmm. So uh, you just saw lines of Germans. Roads were just crowded with lines of thousands of Germans with their hands up on their heads, just giving up. Mm -hmm. um, the only action or almost action we saw um, was, to, I think, about two weeks after the war was over, we called the INR platoon out again. They, they always, if there was a problem, oh, get the INR, you know. Uh, they, uh, they brought us into the CP and they said, well, there's German SS up in the mountains. We're now we're in the Bavarian Alps area. Mm -hmm. um, they either don't know the war was over or they don't care if the war is over. And Gruppen, there's some shacks up there, I'm told, uh, you know, break up their weapons or radios or whatever. So you've got to climb about six peaks, and uh, which is another stupid thing. I mean, think about it. we got to climb all these mountains. I mean, the idiot that's up there looking down and probably laughing like hell, it's going to, we're going to be dead when we get up there, and that's going to be hours away. <laughs> <laughs> this guy, by that time, this guy's in another state, you know. Insane. Anyway, officers have bad dreams, I guess, sometimes. So you didn't find anybody? No, no, no. We found some shacks. Mm -hmm. We broke up some radios and stuff like that, but uh, we didn't find anybody. Mm -hmm. Who's going to wait for us? You're going to sit up there and wait for us? <laughs> uh, you have enough points to get out? I had enough points to get out, not until... Not until uh, June 46. Really? You doing garrison duty? Well, no. No? No, 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 no. I'm a very flexible kind of a guy. They pulled my record. Of course, most of them knew anyway um, what my experience prior to the Army was. So they gave me a two and a half ton truck 
and they told me to put together a band, some music, a group or something, and, yeah. and get some guys together and, and um, go around to the outlying companies that were spread all over the place to, you know, uh, and uh, to occupy and uh, provide a little entertainment. So that's what we did, and little by little it expanded and expanded, and then we moved to Vienna, and then we took over a beautiful coffee house on the main drag with crystal chandeliers, and we had German waiters and tuxedos, and by that time we had a 12-piece orchestra that was picked by General Mark Clark to broadcast to the States at the Christmas in Vienna Ball. My brother was sending me special arrangements. He was with Woody Herman at the mm -hmm. time. and. Um, um, and uh, we were having shows and all this other stuff, and it was, uh, we had a hell of a time going there. And the first sergeant kept calling me, I got three stripes for you. Uh, I got two stripes, uh, two stripes and a diamond, you know, and a couple of rockers. You know. I just give me all these things. And I said, I don't, I don't want that. He says, well, you know, you can take my job pretty soon. I'm going to go home if you would accept it. I says, I don't want your job either. I don't need it. I make more money than you do. He said, what are you talking about? I says, well, we finish at our club. <laughs> then there's a truck outside from the Air Force, the air base outside of uh, town. And they load us up and they take us out to the air base. We play all night for them. They feed steak dinners for us and everything. They give us booze and broads and everything else. And, and, uh, and they pay us well. We, we played a, when we moved to Linz, Austria, we were playing the showboat up and down the Danube. <laughs> I says, you know, we're doing fine. I don't need your stripes. So I left, I, I left still a PFC, but I made out very well. <laughs> so uh, you got out in 46. Yeah. Came home? Yep. And uh, what happened? Came home, and um, my father had just sold out his business. He was manufactured ladies' coats. And um, I, you know, went back to um, see my my professor, my trumpet teacher, um, Charlie Colvin, who was the best in New York for some brush-ups. He was good, you know, Dizzy Gillespie and all these pros used to drop in for a brush-up. So Charlie, Charlie straightened me out a little bit. And, um, and the big bands were breaking up at that time. And the rumba bands got popular. Spanish craze, you're too young for that. And <laughs> and um, so Charlie, I walked into Charlie's one day and he says, go up to Ringo Studio, there's, there's a new Spanish band auditioning trumpet players. I went up there, I could always read anything. I could, if a fly walked across the page of the manuscript paper, I would read his footprints. And um, so there must have been 40 trumpet players up there. And um, so I went and sat down in the... Uh, he said, you know, two more. So I went up and sat in the first chair. And uh, uh, he beat it off, and I played it, period, no mistakes. And uh, he called off another arrangement, and I played that. And um, he says, everybody else go home. I said, wait a minute. I said, before you send those guys home, what's the deal? He said, well, will you give me a few rehearsals? Because I was... You know, I was Union, local 802 New York. I said, the Union says you got to get paid for rehearsals. I says, I'll give you some rehearsals. Uh, I said, but I only get I class A money. I won't accept anything less than class A money. At that time, it was 20 bucks an hour. You know what 20 bucks an hour was in 1946? Anyway. <laughs> so uh, <coughs> that was the Waldorf Astoria room, you know. So um, he said, okay, you got it. So I played, everybody thought I was Spanish. I grew a thinner mustache than this. <laughs> Little girls were talking. We were playing Spanish clubs in, in Spanish Harlem. And, uh, and uh, every little girls were yakety yakety yak. And I turned around to the guy next to me who could hardly speak English. <laughs> and said, what'd she say? She's after you, man. <laughs> I said, I'm not after her, pal. I can't talk her language. Anyway, uh, it was fun for a while, and then my father decided to go back into business. And um, so I went with him, and we, and we moved up to Albany. He found a shop in Albany, and that was it. And since then, then I ran two shops, and um, 
and I sold out in uh, 91. But I'm busy as ever. That's great. I'm busy. I'm busy all the time. Now, how would you um, characterize your military experience? I was a civilian through the whole damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> I was a civilian. I got away with murder. I really did. And, I, and, um, and the guys used to say, how do you get away with it? How do you get away with it? I said, get away with what? I said, well, you, you horse around with these officers. And they ask you dumb questions, and you give them dumb answers, and they laugh and everything. I said, yeah, what the hell? They, they like to laugh, too. So I, you know, I was always a little bit off the wall myself. So. <laughs> and a PFC throughout the whole thing. The whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> Did great, huh? <laughs> well, I'd love to see your hat. Got a minute? Oh, we'll take a minute. Back on. Here. Of course, I want you to know something. Now, this is um, considering that this is uh, 56 years old. Not oh, bad. Not bad, huh? It was a. And I use this when I go to the schools and talk to the kids. It gets their attention. And so somebody said to me the other day. Um, um, you're going to destroy the hat. I said, I said, look, I really don't care. It's a great teaching tool. And people will remember it. The kids will remember it because kids don't know anything about World War II. Mm -hmm. So at any time, if Hitler knew what I was doing with his hat. Okay. Let me zoom in on the inside of that. You're getting the last laugh. I'm getting the last laugh, right. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. Yep. PFC Marwitz gets the last laugh. Yeah. Just something else here. Sure. I don't know what. I just threw a bunch of stuff in here for the hell of it. Because I don't know what you guys did. I didn't know what you guys wanted. Some of the stuff I sent to you. You ever seen one of these? No, sir. This was the other because of two days in, in January of 1945. And that was part of Operation Northland. Mm -hmm. Parachute, mm -hmm. hangar, and the bolts going And one thing I didn't know until I received this, when I received that, I didn't know what it was equivalent to. And it's equivalent to the degree of heroism required, the same as that which would warrant a ward of the Distinguished Service yeah. Cross to an individual. I didn't know that until I got to this thing. Done good for a private. Yeah. There's another thing that you're only on rare occasion will a unit larger than a battalion qualify for a ward of this decoration. And it was a regiment at that. So, you a rainbow guy? You a rainbow? I used to be. Okay. Rainbow did good. I don't know if I sent this to you. <coughs> that's that's a few of the things. Very nice. <coughs> Everybody got this. Is that nice from Harry Truman? Mm-hmm. You probably got some of this. This is from Spielberg because they Who's that kid in Hitler's hat? <laughs> That's me. Huh? <laughs> now, let me look 
pipe trouble. That's me. Well, Fritsch. Okay. I was you about Fritsch? Yeah. Does he look like a German or what? This was taken outside of Dachau, by the way. And these are all the German prisoners in the back of this. That's Fritsch right there. Now, the, the German prisoners are mainly guards? Um, no, there were some SS crooks we got in here. This, this, is, this actually is a page out of the division history book. <laughs> and this is Dachau. I think that's about it. Do you, uh, do you undergo any discrimination being Jewish? Uh, I knew there was one guy that didn't like me. That lasted about a day and a half. <laughs> then I saved his fanny. He became a very good friend of mine. Um, and these are the position books. I think you have enough. I think you have enough. You, you sure Rich, Rich Goldenberg isn't around today? He may be in public affairs. Is that his name? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I can share. He's a major now. Yes. yes. Um, they made a documentary of uh, me and my guys. Oh, then we should be able to. Rich made it? No. A producer, Jeff Cruitt, made it. Oh, okay. It's called Hitler's Hat. Now, sometime probably towards the end of the year or the beginning of next year, it'll show up on. I don't know yet what it'll mm -hmm. show up on. It'll be either. History or discovery mm -hmm. or national public radio, television or something. It'll be on one of those, probably. Um, the first film festival started yesterday in New York City. It's a big one. And uh, Jeff and his, uh, his other co-producers are there pushing it. Very this good. Yesterday and today. And I got a note from him. Um, they got it down to a half hour, and he called me the other night, and he said, this has got to get an award. I got a call. This, this is a copy of a rough cut, first version, of Hitler's Hat. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought Rich might want to take a look at it. This runs 58 minutes, but this is not thoroughly cut yet. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Jeff sent this to um, a, a copy of this to a um, curator in, a, in the, the museum in Washington where they had spent a couple of years. And he called me and he said, Rich, uh, Jeff is really going to score with this one. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Great. I won't make anything out of it, but he will. Yeah. He's a nice kid. He's working hard on it. We're down to two minutes. Okay. Well, we thank you very much, sir. My pleasure. Thank you. Our pleasure.